sometimes it's kind of tough to hear in the back, so just raise your hand if I start talking too low. Um, first of all, obviously, I'm going to go through all my thanks and stuff, but it's just nice to be in facilities that are not quite as nice as the ones I have at home. We're going to talk about a lot of things today. There's a lot of info, and actually a lot of the slides I just looked, you don't have. You have 18 slides, and there's like 50 on here. So we'll figure out a way. Maybe I can email it to you guys, or I'll email it to Coach Mack. He can get it to you guys. Because there's a lot of menus and things like that and layouts, and you'll start to see it. You're probably going to want to refer back to it at some point. So today we're going to talk, you know, Coach Mack asked me to speak, and I said, you know, what kind of things you want me to talk about? And one of the things that we've done over the years, you know, over 22 years of doing this, is start to talk about incorporating new tools in that toolbox. So we're going to talk a little bit about programming. And, you know, you can't really talk about toolbox without kind of the philosophy behind the toolbox of what's going to go in there and where it's going to fit in the grand scheme. And we kind of use almost a pull-down menu kind of system for all of our training to make sure that we're really not neglecting everything and making sure we're hitting everything. You know, if we're doing a push-pull type of workout, if we're doing a full body, I get a group two days a week and so forth. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So obviously there's just tons of people at Bank, and I've, so many people that are speaking here this weekend have influenced my training and, and my work that I've done over the years. Uh, there's some amazing speakers. I mean, I just picked up four or five different little coaching tips and cues from Coach Lansky. Uh, Coach you know, Carla, you know, I had the pleasure of having Coach Carla come and visit us and hang out for a couple of days last, uh, a couple of springs ago when he was with the Niners. We got one of my former athletes up there. Uh, you know, Gray. I mean, there's just so many great speakers here this week, and that you're going to get some great, great stuff out of this. So obviously for Coach Keeper and his staff for bringing me up, and then the tribute to you guys for being here and, and, and the quest of trying to get your programs better. It's one of those things where if you're not evolving in this field, you're not trying to find out some new ways to tweak something, or even if it's just learning a new coaching cue, or, hey, I'm going to try to throw that tool in, or I have that tool that's been sitting there, I have that TRX that's been They've been hanging on every power rack, and I do some rows with them. And I don't really know how to incorporate them that well into some anti-rotation drills or even some explosive drills. So well, hopefully we get to see that today and we'll pick up one thing. If you pick up one thing, I always think these things are worthwhile. The whole weekend's worthwhile. You pick up one thing to help better your athletes. And then obviously my family, you know, I was you know, talking to Coach Davis a little bit about this. Coach Carlisle, the, there's a bigger picture to everything we do, and I'm going to talk about that as far as what our job is as straight and conditioning professionals, whether you're at the high school, I'm in mean, a junior college, or whether you're at the four-year or the professional level, there's a much bigger picture to what we do. It's not just chasing numbers. It's not just X's and O's. There's my background. You guys have that. I'm not going to go through all that shit. Um, so let's talk about the role, right? First of all, before we start talking about tools and philosophy and all that, my whole thing is when you say, like, what's your philosophy? You know, there's a lot of things you can say, I believe in this, I like the Olympic lifts, I like this and this and this. A lot of times you start talking about tools. So we start, the, the basic thing is what's, your, what's the bedrock of that program going to be? So for us, it's building work capacity. With my athletes, it's a, I have a very different situation than most of you. Okay, how many high school uh, coaches work with high school athletes in here? Colleges. Any junior colleges? Junior college football in the state of California is ridiculously big. There are more junior colleges in the state of California than the rest of the United States combined. So the competition is, is amazing down there. In Southern California, it's, it, the, it, the talent pool is ridiculous. NFL guys just coming out of there like crazy, okay? So I have a, a, a different kind of situation in my deal. So I've got to try to think of all these types of things that, that i got to get done because we want to transfer and build better athletes. But sometimes I have an athlete for three semesters. Sometimes they come in late in the summer. I get fall. It's in season. They're starting for us right now. I get one off season with them, and then the summer. Okay. So for the most part, a lot of times they're in and out. If they're qualifiers, sometimes we get them for two. Sometimes we get bounce backs that we've already used a year. They got to they got to get it done in one to get their AA and get out. So a lot of times I have them literally for one special. We got a kid here, Michael Rivera, that plays here at, at, at UT, that was with us basically. Got it late in the summer. Decided to leave Oregon. And late, late the summer plus played the season, gone. Didn't even have really any chance to even meet the kid, you know, along the way. So well, there's a lot of things to get done in my situation. So a lot of things you'll see are very abbreviated, very to the point. But the bottom line is we're here, you know, we're not trying to build the lenses here. We're not trying to build weightlifters or powerlifters. So what's my job? And I was talking about this, this bigger picture. You 
you know, because we think about the things that we try to instill work ethic and not settling and keep breaking the bar. Uh, these are all types of things that we do as professionals that we, we, that we reach for. So if they're going to go and have a part-time job working at McDonald's, we want to hopefully, you know, have that same message, you know, you know, come through in their work, whatever they're doing, whether it's classwork or in their relationships with their family life and so forth. Brian Gross is a friend of mine. He basically said it best. I think, you know, what's your job as a coach is to elevate. What we do is so important and has, can have such a profound effect on these, on these athletes that we deal with every day. You know, the simplest that we can make, the simplest little increase in something seem like an amazing thing, and we can also make a kid feel like absolute shit by just you know, coming at him a different way for not doing something a certain way or you just get tired of what they're doing and so forth. So those are things that we got to do. So the first thing that we talk about is we try to create a culture in our, in our program. Okay, we're fortunate enough to be this little shitty little community college in Southern California, and I'm, I'm speaking at the University of Tennessee. It's a pretty amazing thing for me to be up here. Okay, so but we've over the years we've built a pretty a pretty good reputation of what we do. This is actually our actual weight room, but back in the '70s, we no longer have universal machines, nor do people wear shorts like that anymore. <laughs> and we have to wear shirts in our weight room now. So the same exact weight room. The same exact square footage and everything, but we have obviously tools and things like that we're going to change. These are some things along the way I'm going to throw up there on a slide. Just stuff that we have up on the wall, stuff that we talk about that culture that we're trying to build to really buy into what we do. So that's our, you know, my office door, the office wall, the weight room wall. We got to really ingrain that. A lot of times for us, ingraining into that coaching staff's head for that sport to really make it a very, very important part. So here's our basic sessions, and then the white stuff is the stuff we're going to kind of hit on and where we're going to plug things in, okay? So we come in and we do a little mobility activation. We do what I call four man's activation, a four man's mobility. We come in and we do a foam roll session. We do some Turkish get-ups. Pretty cutting edge shit, right? We do a set of three Turkish get-ups with a, with a kind of a medium load. Come in and do a little bar complex warm-up, and then they go into their Olympic lift, okay? From there, we've got all our strength training. It depends on what it is. I'll show you some four-day stuff that we do and where we plug in these things. Uh, strength training, you know, we've got core, sometimes intermixed in the deal, sometimes at the end, sometimes at the beginning. And then depending on the time of year, some kind of finisher, kind of I call it the exclamation mark, and then we boot them out of the door, and then they go do their thing, okay? And then we finish a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> make sure you have a philosophy and make sure you don't confuse that with your tools, okay? Sometimes, you know, that, that's, that we mix things up. So these are the types of things we're going to look at that would be considered kind of non-traditional, I guess. Sometimes it's in, in, in uh, coordination with actual weights and things like that. But, you know, things like kettlebells and suspension training, TRX training, and sandbag stuff that we really started to incorporate, and all the different types of med balls and jam balls and uh, sand bells and all kind of shit, slides. We incorporate now a rip trainer from TRX, which is pretty much like a cable system, but we can really get a lot of really explosive uh, ballistic movements with it. Different types of sled things that we'll use. I'm not even going to talk about pushing sleds. I'm going to talk about things that we do with the sled from lateral, to the posterior chain, things like that. You'll see it on the video. And then just other stuff that we'll do outside that kind of go into our kind of general preparedness stuff. So the thing to, to, to think about is where are these things going to fit into your schedules? You know, basically, it's like kind of like analyzing your movement menus. And we'll talk about the menus, and hopefully, we have menus, right? We're not just going to grab that and, and pull things out every day. And then, you know, can I can I incorporate some of this stuff into your existing program? Okay, because at this point, it's not about changing what you want to do. It's about trying to better those categories of movement. Okay. As far as the toolbox goes, sometimes there's so many toys, it's almost like I hate it when I find something new and it's good and it works because now I feel obligated. I need to get it in my in somewhere in my program. It might just fit into a core anti-rotation, you know, rotational, anti-rotational menu. It might fit into an explosive menu. It might add to my Olympic lifts. It might give me a variation of Olympic lifts, like a heavy sandbag. So there's lots of things that we can do. But if you find that you've got a ton of stuff in the corner, bands or kettlebells, and you haven't used them in a while, probably want to trade them in for something. Yeah, because you don't, the whole thing about dabbling is kind of a dangerous thing. Right, because you're just kind of dabbling, I'm doing this, I'm doing a little bit of this, and oh shit, I haven't done medicine balls in two months, I'm going to throw that in now. Okay, it needs to kind of be an integral part of your system. So, this is what's funny, is I have a friend of mine, a 
kind of an acquaintance of mine that's a big weightlifting guy. One of the weightlifting guys, not like Coach Lansky, one of the weightlifting guys that thinks that's all you got to do with your guy's weightlifting. I got a volleyball guy weightlifting the shit up. Clean and jerk, snatches, squats, some RDLs maybe. Right? Everything sagittal plane first or not, sagittal man. Right? But we know we got to push, we got to pull. We know we got to work on all, on, all, on all three planes of movement. So he says, hey, I've noticed you're doing some TRX stuff now. So what's the deal? You get rid of all your platforms, you've got TRXs hanging from everywhere now? And the whole thing, the, 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 it's hard for me to wrap my head around that, that somebody would think that the TRX is the tool, is a tool, the suspension training is a tool, and it's added onto our arsenal. So when people ask me, are you these guys, the answer is obviously going to be yes. It's whatever, whatever I can do, whatever I can throw into my, my, my toolbox or my ammo to get my athletes better. Right? So we've all done this. You can pick up any kind of program design book, and you've all seen this. Just needs analysis and your checklist of what kind of stuff you need to get done. You know, obviously, you give a well-planned program, it's going to be an injury prevention program. Okay? If you're training something and it's not an injury prevention program, then it's essentially an injury promotion program. Right? If you're, you're only pushing, or you're never working in another plane, or you're never doing unilateral work, you're probably asking for some trouble. Same goes for you know that whole that whole catchphrase of functional training. Everything that we do should be functional. It needs to apply to something that we're doing, otherwise it's going to be dysfunctional, right? So when you see those terms, it kind of doesn't make sense to me because if you plan things out, you should have a well-rounded program. Once again, just some of the stuff that we have up on our walls, and talking about building that culture that we're trying to create. So think of, think of like when I talk about our, our programs, as like you open up that menu, right? In a restaurant, you've got the categories, but instead of appetizers, it's explosive. You know, instead of desserts, it's core. So that's how we kind of go through everything, and it's really simple. And when we have it on our spreadsheets and our pull downs, we just click on what we want to get done, whether it's bilateral or unilateral options, and I'll show you some examples. And then we just go from there. We plug them in and we go. And we, we change constantly. We change our movements constantly. Okay? We still horizontally push, but it might not just be a straight bench press every day. It might be a single dumbbell bench press. It might be an inclined post grip bench press. It might be, you know, some variation of that. So here's an example of just kind of like, if you look at an explosive menu, these are just a few that we pull out. Any kind of our clean variations, any kind of our snatch variations. Any kind of our partial pulls, dumbbells, snatches, that kind of thing. And then we can tab it so we don't, we're not using the bar or the barbell. And we're doing things like seated box jumps, loading them up with, with, with weighted vests and things like that. Loaded broad jumps, starter metal, cut kettlebell spikes. You'll see that's one of the tools we'll look at. When you look at an E-dominant uh, menu, basically I got, I got bilateral or unilateral choices, right? I don't even know if you guys have this stuff now. So we've got all our squat variations. Uh, lateral stuff and rear foot elevated, split squats and that kind of stuff, and single leg squats. And then you see the stuff in the black, it's kind of the stuff you might see in some of the videos today, just kind of the, the addition of adding a sliding mover into that mix, or the addition of adding maybe some sandbags and things like that for load versus a dumbbell or, or, or a bar. Okay? I feel bad if you guys are trying to write this stuff down, but we'll, obviously we'll get that stuff for you. And this will all be in the notes as well. So hip dominant, same thing. Squatting versus hinging. You'll see a lot of the stuff that we do with the kettlebell. We do it from a, from a teaching perspective of just teaching that difference between a squat and a hinge. Okay? If you look back at the knee dominant, you see hex bar deadlifts. People are like, how's that knee dominant lift? We've always taught our, our dead, we only hex dead. I've got some knuckleheads. We only hex dead. It's much easier to teach for us. But essentially, our goal is to keep our shin and our back angle as close as possible. That's what you teach on the squat, right? So, it does, so for me, it's irrelevant whether I'm holding the dumbbells here, or holding the sandbag here, or holding the barbell behind my neck. Now, if I want to do, you know, you see the deadlifts like this, then that's an RDL, and that goes in our hip dominant, because that's a hinge. So for us, it's a really great teacher with kettlebell swings to teach that hinge versus a squat. Okay, vertical pushing, we got the same thing. I got bilateral and unilateral choices. Vertical pulling as well. Horizontal pulling, and you see the black stuff. What's really helped us with, say, suspension training is a lot of the horizontal pulling. Think about your strong, strong athletes. If you don't have any kind of cable systems or multiple cable systems, for the most part, if I have 75, 80 football players in the room, you know, it's hard to, to you kind of tap them out as far as load goes with, with their bent over rows before the limiting factor becomes their low back. So I got a kid trying to, you know, do rows with 
at 225 pounds, it's going to be really tough to kind of keep that great, you know, position with that, with that extended low back. So for us, with the, with the row variation, we've really thrown, you'll see some of the stuff that we'll do, a lot of load into some of these movements, and we can also decrease load for our kids that aren't able to do it. For the core, basically, we kind of have a couple of different categories. So, you know, we've got our kind of stabilization, anti-extent, our planks and our saws and things like that from that bridging kind of position. Wheelbarrows and ab wheels and stuff like that would, would all be in that category. And then for, you know, then we have like our whole rotational and anti-rotational type of menu. So we try to mix them up, a couple of sets of each in each session or session to session. We'll, we'll make sure we're not going to neglect either one of those. And then, like I said, all the black stuff is stuff that we'll see a lot of the video that we'll look at today. And then there's kind of the other category, and sometimes it's like metabolic conditioning, sometimes it's like finishers, things like that, but that's just all your other stuff, like ropes. And sometimes, like we have, I'll show you some of our injured kids pulling, doing heavy sled work, uh, a couple of shoulder surgery kids in the off season. So they're, they're relying on that, that kind of sled work, and, and on top of like regular single leg squats and things with, not, with no external load. Uh, for their lower body right now. So before we dive into them and look at them, obviously, while I look into it, it's, it's pretty easy to you know kind of live with your in the house you already built and you kind of feel pretty good about it. But like I said, there's a lot of stuff out there that when you start to explore, you think, oh, maybe it's better than this thing that I'm doing now, or maybe it can help or I can add it onto my menu of movements. Like I said, there's a constant evolution, guys. There's, no, there's really no such thing as staying the same. Yeah, if you're doing the same stuff, the same exact stuff this year as you did, you know, three years ago, other people around you are doing better stuff. They're getting better at what they're doing. They're finding better ways and more efficient ways to get to that same uh, end. Don't look to replace your stuff, okay? Look to just try to improve your stuff. It's like, Coach Nancy made a good point. You know, he's up here talking about Olympic this, but if you're a hit guy, you already think it's bullshit anyway, right? So. I understand how that goes. And sometimes my, my whole thing is sit back and, you know, maybe try to pull something out, out of this. So kettlebells, like I said, swings are a huge part. We don't do a lot with kettlebells. We do a lot of swings and then, and then our get-up stuff. But our get-up stuff, we can do it with dumbbells as well. So it's not that big of a deal. It does change where the load sits a little bit. But our, our, our get-up uh, sequences and our half get-ups, which is a big core exercise for us, is just working for the palm and with a nice extended back. We'll use that a lot with heavy, heavy loads for a lot of our core work. And it's going to add a lot. Now think about it, we only have up to 70 pound kettlebells, so we're not going to, it's not going to replace our Olympic lifts at all. The loads are way too light. Okay, my, my, you know, I have my, my, our, our women's record for dumbbell hang snatches is 70 for five. So she swings that 70 pound kettlebell. It's not that hard to swing that thing for two minutes. Okay, so for us, we know, we understand what the role is going to be with that, with that tool. For us, it's a great teaching tool. It's a great posterior chain deal. A lot of times, we'll do something like heavy glute ham raise and complex it with a set of explosive kettlebell swings, okay? Similar kind of hinging kind of movement, posterior chain. So it's a big conditioning tool for us where the injured guys, we have guys that can't run. That group of those guys, of two or three guys, we're, we're doing our conditioning stuff. They bring down the ropes and the kettlebells, and they alternate. They do intervals with that. I got a coach you know, doing time sets with them with that. It's a great, great tool for the guys that aren't able to get in there and do other stuff as well. So like I said, teach as much as you're comfortable with. I'm not that comfortable with our athletes doing snatches and cleans and, and even windmills and things like that with kettlebells right now. It's just not in our realm. So one of the things we teach, you know, obviously is the swing, but sometimes you want to add some load. So we add that eccentric load with a spike to add that onto their Already tough load. And we really want to hammer them on the, on the spike because we, we're, that's the role we're trying to play with that tool. This is just our half get ups, a pretty heavy load, part of their core. A lot of times we're just supersetting them. Some of the loaded jumps in the background. I'm just going to let these play. I just got a, about a minute for each tool on here. But you see, sometimes we use a dumbbell, it's not a big deal on that. The get-ups are, are really a good tool, like I said, just to get the body ready in general. Use some like golfers, do the bottoms up. Kind of focusing on everything. You'll see a couple variations of the kind of loads they'll use. Just the regular Turkish get-up. Uh, arm 
bars, kind of working mobility, stability, the shoulder. Golfers are different now. Different breed. They work hard though. They have a really good golf, one of the best golf in the country. And then this is another variation, this is a Scandinavian get up, just kind of rotate so you actually finish facing the other way. The extent of our stuff, a lot of swings with the kettlebell, and, and swinging the kettlebell totally different than swinging the dumbbell. It just, it's just different. I mean, I went for years. We've been using kettlebells for maybe about five years now. I mean, pretty extensively. Went for years, basically, you know, kind of, nah, it's a dumbbell. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a weight with a handle, you know, but we know it's a totally different move. Don't confuse it with that whole, you know, because dumbbell lifts are very vertical pulling movements where we've got that arcing kind of movement with all the kettlebells and swings, so don't get those too confused. Sandbags are something we've really started to incorporate because we can get a lot of load with our sandbags. We have sandbags up to 120 pounds, which is equivalent to well over 200 pound clean when you try to clean a sandbag with that kind of weight. So for us, we can add it into the mix with our explosive stuff. We can add it into a lot of our metabolic sessions that we're going to do, our, our energy system specific training. Uh, lots of multiple plane movements, lots of uh, rotational kind of movements. You'll see on the video, like just even like reverse lunging with a rotation or coming out of a rotation into a little hang, into a little power clean or a snatch. The unstable loads make it very heavy, obviously. And then we can do a lot of combination moves as well. So just some simple, very simple rotational reverse lunges. Just even when you're squatting in that front squat or reverse your position. Taxes. One of the easiest ways to teach somebody how to squat is have them bear hug that sandbag and sit. If you've ever done that, try to get like a six foot eight inch basketball player to body weight squat. Your hand kind of probably looks like this. All right? And then you have them just hug a weight or just hold a, a goblet squat position and squat and make the bottom out of perfect squat. Sometimes adding load actually makes it a little bit easier. Just some mobility stuff, golfers, just little cyclones or halos. Some metabolic stuff, obviously, incorporate that with drags. And then just the concept of this is kind of like a teaching progression. We get a perfect, nice, vertical spine squat. Uh, bear hug that. Shouldering. So like I said, find a way that, you know, you're trying to find where that's going to plug in. I'll show you at the end a little matrix of where everything kind of plugs in at the end. So you've got, you know, the variations of those Olympic lifts with cleans and snatches. You can see our facilities are a little nicer than these over here. Then you can add that whole rotational aspect to a lot of these moves too. A lot of times you don't need a whole lot of load. Very taxing. So you can fit into like our knee down and stuff, our explosive category, even your finisher stuff. I like to throw this in. It's just one of those things that we talk about with the culture of just that whole, you know, the bringing people together with, with, with kind of a common pain and anguish. You know, uh, med balls and, and things like that are, are tools that we have that really we can't, we can do things with them that we can't mimic because we have that completely unhip, uninhibited explosive and with no deceleration if needed. So whether I'm scoop throwing a 50 pound sand bell or taking a 15 pound or 10 pound medicine ball and really just working on getting good swing rotations into the wall, is something that I can't really mimic. The speed of that movement, the, the plane that I'm moving in and things like that. So, you know, those are all things that we've done for years. I mean, I remember watching Vern Gambetta videos way back when, you know, in the late 80s. And, going, wow, I've never, you know, you've never seen this kind of stuff, and it was really, really crazy stuff, but it's like some of the drills, the exact same drills we're using today, you know, 25 years later, you know, we're using the same exact, I'm using that same exact rotational throw with the pivoting of the hips and all that stuff. So we can add, obviously, to our core, our explosive, you know, our rotational explosive stuff, and then our metabolic stuff as well. And this is kind of just a compilation of just a bunch of, this is just stand-up. For us, we have these stand-bells and they're quite heavy, they're 30, 40, 50 pounds. 
So now it gives us a chance to not only have a work grip strength to grab sand in their hands and throw or carry, and it's completely uninhibited. We can't really do that with weights. It's, it's med ball, swings, rotational swings, trying to get the hips around. We'd obviously come into our rotational category with our core. Uh, starting coming in with, you know, we broke, we just got these, these are actually the old school slam balls, and uh, we broke all the other ones, and they just, they, they pop right off with the, with the actual medicine ball at the end, but these are the old school ones that just happen to be a little more expensive, but they're a little tougher. Then we've got things like rotational slams and the jacks, a little more mobility, uh, a little heavier loads than you're going to get with med balls. And then one of the things I really like to do is, these are the old jam balls that, you know, are filled with sand, so they don't have that bounce. Don't try that with a medicine ball, you're going to hit my face. So what we're trying to do is really elicit that, 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 that over speed of that, you know, expansion of the shoulders with that, because of the heavy med ball into, into that counter movement with the arms. This is more of a volleyball girls just there doing that. Slides, if you haven't incorporated slides, it, it's really, really a great, great tool, even if it's just for core sake, because now you start to take that, you know, you're planking your, you're planking your, your guys and your girls, you know, for a minute, 90 seconds, two minutes, having contests for 10 minutes, it's just, there's a lot of stuff you can be doing instead of watching somebody in a plank, All right? So we want to try to make most of those things very dynamic. So one of the things we can really do is kind of add more a dynamic, uh, a more dynamic aspect to that to that anti-extension in a plank, or even just like laying out. So now we can actually work from sawing, we can do single leg sawing. We can now turn around and do things like supine hip extension leg curls against the, just the load of that, whether it's just the friction of sliding something on the turf, or sliding on a towel on like a gym floor, you're still going to get a pretty decent load on there. <clears throat> and you'll see how they can make it a little harder and easier. And then we can take that down, incorporate it with heavier loads like sandbags, and have a rear foot sliding or a foot sliding out to the side. It's going to make it much, much tougher. So just so when we talk about sawing, just anti-extension. So we just want to basically keep that, we don't want her to come over too far, but just kind of keep the hips, hips steady, almost like they're just like, you know, sawing, actually just, you know, moving their body flat in that particular table. When we start to add that load now, we've got the push and pulling effect now going with the slide. And you know, back in the days, people would do it on slide boards, it wasn't that practical. So now we can actually slide, that's actually a small sand belt. And when we start to do sand belt things with that, now we can go with that anti-extension move with the upper body into, we want to incorporate a little bit tougher moves into that Spider-Man push-up. Now we've got a great core movement, but it's also a great horizontal pushing movement as well. If we're going to single leg, which is, which is pretty tough, into that hip extension leg curl. Once again, plug that into hip dominant uh, movement in the unilateral category gives us another thing. You know, obviously we do heavy one leg RDLs, we do single leg back extension, we do move hand raises, we do all that kind of good stuff. But now, now we have a way to throw that into the mix with the slides. And as long as you're not chasing numbers, you know, Coach Carlisle talked about that last night, it's like sometimes we get really wrapped up in chasing numbers. And, you know, the, the reality is there has to be a bigger picture to your programming and being able to appreciate all the different types of strength we're going to get from and realize the numbers aren't going to be that great when we start to throw in a lateral step up. It's going to change the numbers quite, quite dramatically from your traditional step up, or anything single like that for that thing. I really love, this is one of my favorite books ever, it's basically Tough and Training for Sports. Years ago, we picked it up, and just some of the concepts really apply to our training. You know, and this is the big one for me, it's almost like you know, you're running your team and you're doing gassers. And I tell our guys, you know, 15 minutes into that session, and they get on that line, if there's not a moment with that, when this thought goes through your head, this is the thought. How many, how many, how many of you compete in athletics? Okay, you all had this fucking thought, I'm telling you. I curse, I'm sorry. You're on the line, you're thinking, why, why did I come to school here? I could have gone to this place. They don't run like this over there, or, or you know, eh. Do I really want to play football? You know, is there something else I can do? That's, that's, that's being a human, right? If you're not, 
you always, you do have those kids that don't think that. They just they'll do whatever you come to do until they break. But for the most part, 99.9% .9 of us will go through that in their head. And that's, to me, that's like overcoming that is, is worth so much more than anything that we can do in the weight room. It's just like that, that kid dealing with that personal confrontation. Once again, I just kind of go off on these tangents, but I think there's a, like I talk about the bigger picture of programming, and that's definitely part of it. So a new tool that we've added in the past year, we were pretty much limited to the medicine ball rotational empty cable systems. So for us, the rotational aspect of explosive and ballistic training was all basically lying in the hands of that medicine ball or the slam ball with the rope, okay? So now we've added this rip trainer, and it's got different uh, strength in the cores, and we can really change things up. We can, we can go into stability moves, which I'll show you anti-rotation moves, planking moves, just holding in positions, or more explosive moves, and really getting really ballistic and really working you know, that rotational power. So for us, it's really added to us. It really adds to that rotational part of the menu for the core, okay? Go look at some of that. So here's just a fish sport for some of our baseball kids. And the thing was really great, it's really great, we really get to work the posterior aspect of that, of that rotation now that we don't really see. Now we get to more of a, step, you know, like a planking move or anti-rotation move, figure eights. Once again, just, it's not the load of the lunge, it's the fact that I'm anti-rotating and anti-side flexing right now against a pretty decent load, okay? Now we've got moves where we can explode through rotational aspects in different levels and try to hold that plank at the end. But I want to whip through those first two so that the, the last part is actually difficult. You see it's actually quite difficult to hold that plank at the end or that pillar at the end. So for us it adds, it's that fish fork again. And for us, we've got a lot of things going on here because now we're not only we're working deceleration on the landing, but he's getting turned as he decelerates. So if he just lets his body go and doesn't try to anti-rotate on the landing, he's going to step or he's going to fall forward. Okay, so for us, that's added into our deal as well. We can also throw that in to energy system specific metabolic training. Okay, so we can throw that in and we're doing time sets or we're doing something in a circuit or a finisher, we can throw that in the mix as well. Okay, so we get that double whammy. We've all used stretch bands for different things. A lot of times using it, you know, a lot, of people, a lot of people only use it to assist on pull-ups and things like that. We do that as well. But, you know, when you have these strong ones, the loads are amazing with the stretch band. Okay, I'm not just talking about putting them on the end of bars and things like that and doing dynamic stuff. I'm talking about just kind of using the bands, that, just the bands by themselves. So you're going to see, we talk about, I'm a total, if you ever heard me talk about speed stuff or any of our sports speed stuff, we always talk about the relevance of, of decelerating. I'm obsessed with brakes, right? Like I've always said, nobody ever got hurt, you know, jumping up. So, so the whole braking, I, I said that once at a conference and a physical therapist said, they, yeah, they've seen people get hurt jumping up. But the reality is it's probably the counter movement to jump up, so where they were actually braking, you know, or, or that deceleration effect. So I'm not gonna, I wasn't gonna inch on that one. So I'm really obsessed with the brakes and the greatest the greatest analogy is, you know, you can have the fastest car, but how fast would you drive it if you knew you had no brakes? So for us, a lot of our deceleration drills are just body weight, but then when they get stronger and we're working our stick landings and things like that, we hook up the bands to them, or we hook up partners with bands, and we get in big groups, and we work on the stick landings with that added load. You'll see some of that. But now, a guy named Dave Schmitz, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, is just comes up with some really, really great tools. A lot of them are very metabolic, but he's got some great, great strength moves. And one of the things he just gave up, as I'll show you in the video, was just almost like the belt squat style with heavy bands, okay, which I'll show you as well. So now we can really work some great strength move or the explosive moves under that load of that dynamic load of the band, okay? And then you'll see us do some stuff with our core, with our anti-rotation, with the band as well. Kind of whizzing through this stuff, so. So just working anti-rotation, and by going overhead, we work anti-side flexion, so it's just a variation of that power press. The first thing kids want to do is they want to grab the biggest band, and they can't keep it in the center, so we really want to rein them in a little bit, it's just a one-inch band right there. 
Now here's that belt set up. So we take one, whip it around, put the other one through over the feet. So now we can get into speed squats and things like that, and the load's actually pretty decent. And if they're taller, it's even worse. And then working a little more, this, this is the injured crew that I talked about. So, you know, we're, we're, we're lifting with football right now, and these guys are doing some, some, some lower body specific stuff. Right now, this is kind of their finisher, where they're doing 10 on, 10 off, so they're, they're basically 10 jumps with a, with a 10 second count, but you can see his count. A little slower than 10, but uh, into their next set. So really, really crazy stuff, and I really like because it's really unloaded when you get into that deep squat, and then the load really breaks. And this is really talking about just the stick landings, and then in a repeat jump, and then changing the foot placement, right? Making sure you always change the foot placement if you're trying to work on deceleration and working on single leg, you know, hop and stops and things like that as well. So there's lots of great things we can do to add that load. And once you, get, you can see right away. We add it in for those guys. That's their knee dominant work for the day. That's their explosive work for the day. Okay. We'll still. I got a shoulder surgery guy. We're still going to single arm train up. I'm still going to do my heavy dumbbell snatches, and I'm still going to do single arm uh, rows and single arm thrusts and that kind of stuff. So it's not like we we try to work around. Because Lance had mentioned that working around injuries, we do that obviously a lot. This is the one we probably I want to get on. Spend a little more time with this. So many people have sleds. And they just get out there, and it's just kind of like their, their, their competition deal with the sleds, and they just push, push, push. There's so many things we can do with the sled, though, from a functional standpoint to build strength. We talk about that stride length strength, and then also a lot of the lateral movements that we tend to be weak in. Just frontal plane movements in general, we try, to, we try to incorporate quite a bit in. So you've got your pushing, of course, but we've got all this great lateral sled pulling movements that we can do. You know, we'll talk about just building athleticism, karaoke walks, and side slides. And then duck walks that we'll see, which is an amazing tool. It's almost like a walking RDL with that hamstring. And then just combo carries, and I got that from Dan John, just talking about not only getting that horizontal load pulling behind you or pushing, but now we're, we've got a vertical load with something we're carrying. So it could be a heavy sandbag, you'll see, or sometimes just a single rack kettlebell or a single shoulder sandbag or a high low where I'm racking a kettlebell with a different loaded you know, uh, kettlebell or dumbbell on this other hand or sandbag. So you see some of that too, but some of the patterns that will work. So I think the first one, I think it's a Frank, yeah, so we're just Frankenstein walks. So now the concept with a Frankenstein walk is real simple, right? We're going to turn that whole thing into one big powerful chain. You know, and it's almost like we're pushing a sled with the hands. We're feeling like that's my cue is to act like they're pushing a sled versus they're obviously pulling the load. Now we got heavy drags, right? We got 200 plus pounds on these sleds. And he's not even trying to lunge, he just ends up turning into a lunge because he's trying to really have them increase their, the length of that stride. You know, we go from, from forward drags to reverse drags. These are, the, these are my injured guys with a lot of weight. You know, our lateral slide, and you know, the cue is obviously the driver being the back, the back leg driver, reach and slide, try to really get a good push, keep it smooth so they're not popping up and down. And then a much stronger movement is going to be that karaoke drag, okay? So basic patterns that we're doing, like a warm up and things like that. Here's that duck walk. Not a great example here. The next gets a little bit better. But the whole key is, you know, you get in that, you get in that, that, that RDL, get morning position, and then we, we get in that position, we drag through the heels. And we've got a decent amount of load there. It's a lot of work with the hamstrings and the glutes to get your body going there. So it takes a long time, obviously, to get moving with a decent load. Now, when we talk about com this is some of the combination stuff as well, okay? So when we combine, it, it, it changes everything. It, it absolutely is a horrible, horrible thing. So you just gotta, you know, take into perspective what you're gonna do. Don't go crazy with the loads. It doesn't take a lot of load, the vertical load, to make that, that a terrible, terrible feeling. You know, you go just, you know, marching or striding. Now you lose the arms. Now you get that vertical load, it changes everything. When you go to a high low, it changes everything. Obviously, it's gonna, it's gonna affect the core much differently. 
And you'll see a couple different high-low variations. The worst of the double highs, the worst because you can't you can't stride very far. I think you'll see that on here too. Just a heavy, when we start talking heavy, you can really go heavy, you know, heavy load up there, which is a, you know, probably 130, 140 pound sandbag. <laughs> Of course, we have to experiment with everything before we try them on our athletes. It starts to get pretty difficult, so you want to be careful if you're going high with anything. Just see how difficult it is for him to, to, to pull. So it's going to change the load of that back sled. It's going to change the, the uh, intensity of, that, of the sled drag. There's a double high. So Nate does a pretty good job from our assistant coaches. Does a pretty good job, pretty strong for a core, staying nice and tall. But once again, just another change up that we can throw into a sled drag. We haven't done any loading on the laterals yet. Not that it would be good, we just haven't played with it yet. But from just a, a metabolic perspective and a strength building perspective and a core taxing perspective, it's really, really, really good stuff. We might do a little more. Now, when you, obviously, when you single side load, it's going to be tougher. And that's the first thing I got from Dan John, just some of this concept of just loading one side, come back, and doing the next set on the other side, and so forth. of the last one. So just have, you know, that, that whole concept of vertical and uh, the horizontal loads coming at you. Okay, let me see what I got. Okay, TRX, this, this is added a lot. And when I first got involved with doing some ring stuff, was, it was, it wasn't even all the core stuff and all the pulling stuff for us. It was our ability to unload our jumps for our big 300 pounders. So, you know, being able to put our hands in there and being able to tether that the weight, like load or unload based on how we feel, or now give my big guy that's never been into a deep, deep single leg squat the ability to do it on his own. And as he gradually progresses and overloads his body, he ends up pulling less and less with his hands. So for us, we started doing a lot of that. Then I started really expanding out. So it expands into all those categories. You see, just some examples of the different things that we'll do with the with that suspension trainer. It gives us the ability to take a rowing movement or a pushing movement and change it. Just by them moving back, just by them straightening their legs, you're gonna change that load. So I could say a set of, I could say let's do a set of eight or a set of five and get into a position where the fifth one is gonna be the end of that gas tank, okay? So real easy, I can make it tougher, we can add combination moves. Now we're gonna fire everything, work core and everything else, and be able to get a pretty decent load there because the speed are elevated so high, and work the combination of a, I just call that a partner row. We can change up, change up the lever system a little bit, I think, here. Do some horizontal pushing. And in spite of, you know, what kids think a lot of times, you know, they come in, they can come in at 300 pounds, but not be able to do a good set of push-ups for the most part, blocking that core strength. So there's some of the press variations that we saw with Van, using it with that. Here's some rotation movements that we'll get with our core work on the TRX. And we can make that tougher, easier, whatever we want, just by placing the feet. We can elevate the feet. We can add weighted vests. We can make them pause. We can have them work on slow recentrics, whatever it's going to take for whatever rep range that we're in on that day. On this, on this particular day, that's going to be their horizontal push for the day. And then just working some core, rotation, simplest, probably the simplest rotation move on the, with the TRX. Get through this. And 
and just some of the other stuff, and I'll just show you the video, just things that we have going on and um, pulling them into the mix. Just heavy uh, farmer's walks, you know, 100 pound dumbbells, 120, 130, 140 pound dumbbells. Heavy carries of any kind now, especially when you're down taxing grip, it's gonna be it's gonna be good for you. Heavy ropes, heavy jump ropes. Just after the football lift. Obviously, this is like this last week, just, just off-season stuff that we're doing. General, you know, physical preparedness type activity. Sledge. We got ropes. When we go ropes like partners, we actually have a rabbit on one side, so we have to match whatever they're doing. If they, they can actually move laterally, we're not doing it right now, but they can actually most, most of the time on the field moves laterally, jumps. They can do ice skaters. They can do anything. We, do, we have kind of like a mini slosh pipe version in our weight room. This is a lot of the uh, almost like metabolic stuff that we'll do, but it's not really heavy enough for a lot of the strength stuff. There's water in there, obviously. So it's a short one, it's only a five footer. But I still do a lot of work with our golfers, we do a lot of work with volleyball girls. Some of our rope stuff outside in a, in a, in a circuit. And then probably the most, you know, overlooked movement is just a basic like tug of war move, right? So we have this, we almost have a competition at the end of every Football Olympic session, offense versus defense. They got a big and a small, a skill and alignment on both sides. And these guys are so tired from the workout and the circuit that we just did. And we fight, and the, the losing team has some, something, you know, that they're crawling up, down, or something, whatever, they're, whatever we pick that day. But the whole thing for us is just, you know, that's, that's our whole thing. We try to set them off every day, part of that culture, and, and, and competing, and having fun. And, you know, razzing the other guys a little bit. And it's we're really almost 50 50. Almost every other day it's offensive or defense, we really don't know. So the whole thing is just planning out your program, fitting them in there. Don't throw them in for the sake of throwing them in. You know, the menu system works very, very well. Keeps you keeps you on your toes as far as you know, making sure we're not missing any movements. Okay? And especially when you go bilateral, unilateral as well. And don't forget the different planes. You know, I talked about that that dabbling. <clears throat> and then they need to be a part of something like the buy-in. So Coaches have to buy into it. You guys, as a staff, have to buy into it before you get into it. And then, just as far as fitting things in, you know, you're going to have on heavy lifting days. You know, we go outside and do our stuff. It's going to be more of our strongman stuff. And then on our on our pull days with football, which would be we don't let guys bend over. It's more part of our culture thing. Um, that's kind of our average sets per session. That's what we train. Football is normally about 20 sets, and we're out. Uh, typical sessions, depending on how big they are, always under an hour, no matter what. We never teach slow concentric moves. We're always exploding everything, um, pushing the pace, having that mindset. When I rest through these, uh, four days. This is a football off season, preseason, four days. You know, pushing one, pushing on two, pulling on two. So that's kind of how we lay it out. That'll be on my slides. We give to you as well. And then just a set, uh, just, there's, there's some samples on the slides as well. Kind of bump you guys to get it. And then this is pretty small, but this is basically all the tools we just talked about and what they add to each category. The categories would be vertical there. Okay, so where they would plug in basically for, for our menus. And that's on the door when they leave the weight room. And I, and I got this from Holy Cross when I visited them. I just I love that, that whole idea that, you know, they know it's a place of business. We're going to get better in there for sure. So now the whole thing is just going out and, and trying to get your programs better. You guys can email me. Uh, you know, uh, we have visitors all the time. You know, and I know some coaches do that. Oh, call me and visit me, and then they never return your call. We have people down almost weekly, almost weekly from all over the country. Um, a lot of high school coaches, things like that, trying to get ideas. So we're, we're we, you know, I love coaches. I love talking shop. We, we have, you know, I mean, interns that kids need. Uh, we get to do a semester worth of internship. We, we do that. I've had kids, you know, from all over the place, from North Dakota, from, from Michigan, you know, as well. So we, we, we've got a pretty nice little uh, home down there that we like to play around with. So, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll try to, I'm going to get all this, you know, make sure that we get the slides to you guys, maybe in a PDF version, so it's nice and big as well. Um, get
Hit me up. You have any questions? My email's on. Oh, you don't have my email on there, huh? Is it off? Can you get it back on or is it off? Yeah, just play that or just go all the way down. Go maybe like to the last slide. Basically, my name, Robert. Dos Remedios, all you know, no space, at Canyons.edu. I'm going to whisper right here. That shit little slides. Oh, <laughs> can you scroll down to the last slide? Thanks, have a great day.